I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to episode 136 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today, we have an interview with Michelle Cox. Michelle Cox is the author of the multiple award-winning Henrietta and Inspector Howard series, as well as Novel Notes of Local Lore, a weekly blog dedicated to Chicago's forgotten residents. She suspects she may have once lived in the 1930s, and having yet to discover a handy time machine lying around, has resorted to writing about the era as a way of getting herself back there. Coincidentally, her books have been praised by Kirkus, Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and many others, so she might be onto something. Unbeknownst to most, Michelle hoards board games she doesn't have time to play, and is, not surprisingly, addicted to period dramas and big band music, and Marmalade, A Child Lost, A Spiritualist, An Insane Asylum, A Lost Little Girl, when Clive, anxious to distract a depressed Henrietta, begs Sergeant Frank Davis for a case, he is assigned to investigating a seemingly boring affair, a spiritualist woman operating in an abandoned schoolhouse on the edge of town, who is suspected of robbing people of their valuables. What begins as an open and shut case becomes more complicated, however, when Henrietta, much to Clive's dismay, begins to believe the spiritualist's strange ramblings. Meanwhile, Elsie begs Clive and Henrietta to help her and the object of her budding love, Gunther, locate the whereabouts of one Liesel Klinkhammer, the German woman Gunther has traveled to America to find and the mother of the little girl Anna, whom he has brought along with him. The search leads them to Dunning Asylum, where they discover some terrible truths about Liesel. When the child Anna is herself mistakenly admitted to the asylum after an epileptic fit, Clive and Henrietta return to Dunning to retrieve her. This time, however, Henrietta begins to suspect that something darker may be happening. When Clive doesn't believe her, She decides to take matters into her own hands with horrifying results. We would like to welcome Michelle Cox to the program. She is the author of A Child Lost. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, thank you for having me. A Child Lost focuses on loss, but also hope. Henrietta's miscarriage, Anna's loss of her mother, and Gunther's search for answers. What gave you the idea to write this story? Well, that's a good question. You know, this series is a little bit different than your typical mystery series where you just have the same doc characters. They just solve a different crime every time. That's not really this series. This is much more progressive where each book sort of builds on the last. It's really more about these characters that are developing and evolving and what's going on with them. And there's lots of plot lines running. When I sat down to write this book, I had to pick up where book four, A Veil Removed, left off. And one of those storylines was Elsie, who is Henrietta's younger sister. In book four, she meets this German immigrant custodian, the mysterious Anna. And I sort of end that book a little bit on a cliffhanger so that when I started with book five, I had to resolve what's going to happen there. And all stories, especially mysteries and conflict, I decided that Anna would be this little child who is an epileptic. Gunther and Anna are lost in America looking for Anna's mother. Then I decided to take the Clive and Henrietta plotline and weave that with that story. 
again, because this is not like your typical series, they're not really a detective couple. I mean, they are, but they don't really have a shop where people are coming in and asking them to solve their crimes. The mystery or the crime sort of has to find them. And it's like the BBC or the PBS shows like Midsummer or any of those where it's sort of a joke that there's this small English hamlet and it has these, you know, hundreds of murders. It's kind of like that. How many times can Henrietta be in danger? How many times can somebody in their immediate circle get murdered? So it's a little bit tricky every time to come up with a mystery. So this time I decided to weave the two storylines together, the Elsie storyline and the Clive and Henrietta, and they're on board now to try to help Elsie and Gunther find the mysterious Liesel and Anna. A lot of this just sort of comes to me as I'm writing. And once this concept of the lost child kept emerging, I thought, okay, I'm going to use this. And there's lots of references really to lost children. So you've got Anna, you've got the miscarriage, you've got the Stanley Rose mini plot line going because her mentally challenged brother is often referred to in the book as a lost child. You've got Clive's lost child marriage. So there's a lot, I think, going on. And as I'm writing and it's evolving, I'm like, yes, okay, this works. That's a long answer to that question. (laughs) It definitely worked. I really enjoyed all the characters. The scenes in the asylum were very harrowing to read. I could picture how terrifying that whole experience must have been. Did you find such places in your research? Yeah, for sure. Dunning was actually a real asylum on the northwest side of Chicago. The Chicago State Hospital was its official name, but it was called Dunning because it was in the Dunning neighborhood. That was a very real place. There's a lot of information out there. I even was able to look at some pictures that were not very nice. There really was a crazy train that ran from downtown Chicago. The Milwaukee Northwestern Railroad actually extended its tracks so that the train line almost went right up to the front door of Dunning. So cops or whoever would stuff people onto this train downtown and send them on the crazy train that's straight to the asylum. I think I mentioned this in the acknowledgments that there's mass graves of like 30,000 people there. It was a, a very nasty place, but I had to watch it because this is a Clive and Henrietta novel, so it really couldn't go that dark. I wanted to pick how horrible it was, but not get too graphic. Hopefully I was able to do that. I didn't read the acknowledgments because I actually listened to the book on audio, so I didn't know about the crazy train. Yeah. And you're just saying that it just reminds me of the concentration camps, and that's really Well, that's a, that's a good yeah. analogy. Getting hit with a fact like that. Yeah. yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, it's very startling. Also, as an aside, I think maybe in audiobooks, they ought to read the acknowledgments. <laughs> I think you're right. I'm surprised that they didn't, actually. I, this is embarrassing to admit, but I'm just in the middle of listening to my own audiobook. So I'm on book three, so I haven't gotten to, you know, what they've done. They should put that in. Maybe you could throw that out to your publishers. Sorry to derail you, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. So was it actually a practice to place people with epilepsy into asylums instead of giving them medical care? Oh, yeah, for sure. There was actually a big epileptic colony in downstate Illinois, in Dixon. That's where you were sent if you had epilepsy. Their child developed epilepsy or showed signs of that. That that was the recommended practice is for them to be sent away. So terrible. Wow. In the book, it seemed like they might have just been starting to realize that epilepsy was a medical condition because it seemed like, especially like Henrietta and Clive, they knew about the condition. but it wasn't necessarily practiced on the whole as a medical condition. And they really didn't have any known treatment for it. I think they did try to give them those salts of bromide. I did do some research on that. Of course, that's not going to work. They didn't really know how to treat it. They just thought a quiet life is what would be conducive to helping that person. I think it was more to remove them from society because people just didn't know how to react to their seizures. I write a blog called Novel Notes of Local Lore. All of those stories came from my experience in a nursing home. Every week I take a different person's story. These stories are like stranger than fiction. Many of those people spoke to me about this institution in Dixon. If you had any sort of problem 
at all you were sent there counts of what went on there were just horrible the same as Dunning well Henrietta and other characters were 26 girls for those who haven't read the first books in the series can you explain what that is 26 was a game that known only in Chicago it was played in taverns Sometimes you could find a game of 26 at the back of a cigar store. What it was is basically a betting game where you would pay like a quarter to get in to the game. And then you would have to roll 13 dice a certain number of times to get a perfect score of 26. And if you did, then you got a free drink on the house. And so the bar, wherever they were having these games, would hire these very pretty young girls who were called 26 girls and their job was supposed to be recording all the scores like or on the bar and record. But really their job was to push drinks, especially on men. You said there's 13 dice? Yeah. So that means each dice would have to be two. Yes. Wow, yeah. that would be really hard. To I think get. it would, right? Yeah, but for some reason this was like a really popular game. I've tried to fathom it out and it doesn't make, and I'm a big game person. It was the idea of that free drink. Uh -huh, <laughs> right. And why not? Yeah. <laughs> Is this the first time that Henrietta and Clive have encountered spiritualists? And how much fun was it to include this dimension in your story? Oh, it was great. I've always wanted to do this. I mean, it's like every Victorian murder mystery or Scooby-Doo or whatever has the seance episode, right? So I'm like, oh, I have to do this. And it's so fun to do, like you're saying, because you can just make it all up. It's great. And I had fun writing her because she's a very mysterious character. She's kind of funny sometimes with the way she interacts with Clive, tries to put him in his place. Clive doesn't really know quite how to handle this. It's not exactly black and white. I really loved this character so much that I had a little cliffhanger at the end so that yes. she would have a way back in. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, give us more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Henrietta was a believer right away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Didn't right? take her long at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> she told her what she wanted to hear. I thought it was such a nice touch that you included so many details about the historical facts in 1930 Chicago. Henrietta had experienced the two different worlds, as we all have still today, the haves and the have-nots. Do you feel that Chicago was a microcosm of what the rest of the country was experiencing at the time? Oh, I think so, for sure. I mean, like you're saying, it's still the same today, kind of. But there were slums, there was shelters, hotels, lots of charities. So in that day, I think maybe even more so than now, there were various churches and immigrant groups that ran their own shelters or their own centers to help people. And one of those was the Bohemian Home for the Aged. Factors into the book, that's where Anna gets taken. I actually worked there in the 90s. The official name of the place was the Bohemian Home for the Aged and Orphans. It was set up by the Czech people, Czech immigrants to help any Czech people who needed it and beyond. There was a lot of that going on in the first book of the series. I mentioned that Henrietta has to go stand in line for free food at the armory in Chicago. Obviously, that type of thing was happening all around the country. And then you switch to the other end of the spectrum, which is the haves. Even during the Depression, there was still wealth on the north side, a little bit some pockets on the south side as well. Yeah, I really do feel like it was a microcosm. I read somewhere that Clive and Henrietta are based on a real couple. How did you discover them and what made you decide to flesh them out? Okay, well, actually, it's really only Henrietta that was a real person. Clive is completely invented. Henrietta is one of the women that I met in the nursing home, or the way I changed her name, obviously. She shared her story with me. She was this amazing, very spunky woman. She used to follow me around and tell me her story. Like I said before, I mean, a lot of this is stranger than fiction. But she used to tell me that she was this bombshell working in the 30s and 40s in Chicago. She was very beautiful. She was very virtuous, but she was always working in these sleazy establishments in the 30s and 40s in Chicago. She used to tell me that she had a man-stopping body and a personality to go with it. <laughs> um, who says that? So funny. So all of the jobs that are listed in book one that had Anna gets like she's a Dutch girl at the World's Fair. She's a curler girl at Marshall Fields. She's a 26 girl. She's an usher at a burlesque theater. 
those were all real jobs that this woman actually had. So I took all of those, put that in the book. I took her family 